Okay. Um, so um, we're going to be building in this lecture on some of the modeling and some of the concepts that we put into place during our previous session. Um, that previous session itself involved taking a, a model that we had previously yet built um, with susceptible infected and recovered individuals and elaborating it in a couple of ways. Um, uh, most notably, we put into place an accumulative stock, uh, an accumulation of count of infections, which I noted initially um, could be seen as representing a cumulative number of individuals represented, or alternatively, cumulative number of uh, infections that had occurred. Um, beyond that, we put into place uh, some mechanisms to allow for uh, exploring the model with different assumptions, and particularly different assumptions uh, regarding uh, aspects of behavior and aspects of risk. So uh, changes in assumptions about contact rates and transmission probabilities per discordant contact, per contact between the susceptible and infected and the average duration of the treatment time. And I noted that these were uh, broadly emblematic of, of different classes of interventions. Things like faster contact tracing might reduce the time someone spends infective circulating in the population. Potentially an app to alert people if they were exposed or uh, greater enforcement of uh, quarantine measures, et cetera. Something like uh, masking uh, might reduce the likelihood of transmission from a from an infective to a susceptible given exposure. So this probability of transmission per discordant contact um, would be lowered. Uh, by by mask use, um, and that could also be lowered by vaccination. It was noted, sure enough. Finally, we saw that we briefly mentioned that quantities such as contacts per day might be affected by factors such as work at home orders or or regional specific lockdowns or social distancing efforts, et cetera. Um, these, in short, these interventions impact the model through different mechanisms, through different particular routes. And they affect the model and, and um, by affecting, they affect the system through different routes, through different pathways, and they affect the model correspondingly through sort of abstract representation of those pathways. And it leads to um, corresponding results. This is why we build models to help us reason through the impact of these pathways. And interventions are often one of those things, these attempts to change the situation, the ability to look at those, to use a lens to examine their trade-offs is one of the big draws of this model. And last time we explored a set of scenarios which involved different assumptions about behaviors related to those three quantities related to duration of infection, probability of transmission per discordant contact, and finally um, to uh, contact rate. Now, in so doing, we actually stumbled on a notable finding, namely that while investing and reducing each of them in turn in isolation would confer some results, some benefits in terms of lowering the number of people who got infected or correspondingly raising 
the number of people who remain susceptible by the final time who have dodged the infection. Well, changing each of them made some difference. Changing all of them made a qualitative difference. When I say qualitative difference, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we, we saw it in the uh, in the later part of class, but what uh, of the class session? But in what sense am I saying that the situation was qualitatively changed by simultaneously lowering all of those, by halving each of them, yielding um, a halving of the basic reproductive number by two times two times two, or eight, a factor of eight? Um, we saw it was a qualitative difference. What do I mean by a qualitative difference? I, I argued we crossed a tipping point. We went from one situation to a totally different situation in terms of how the infection progresses within the population. What am I to what am I referring to? Yes, uh, the, the infection stopped before it got going. Really, that initial infective. And it's not that they didn't infect anyone, but uh, they, they infected such a small number that it didn't form an outbreak. The number of people infected at a given time actually went down over time, didn't rise. And on all the previous scenarios, uh, the baseline, that's our reference scenario, the scenario involving positing a half the contact rate or independently, another scenario involving half the probability of transmission, for example, or the, the one half the, the um, time to recovery. In all, all those cases, the infection still took off. It's just the burden of it was lower. We bent the curve, but we didn't crush the curve, right? We didn't um, eliminate um, this, this rise. And so there's still a sizable outbreak it's just it spared many more people. Well, it's one of the points of reflection that both the baseline and these alternative scenarios did leave some people remaining in the population because after all, the infection at some point becomes no longer sustainable. What is it that prevents it from becoming from being sustainable? What is it that that in that original closed population model, SIR, with no loss of immunity, what is it that prevents it, the infection from, from just going on and on and affecting more and more people and affect eventually everyone? What, what's, what's the fundamental thing that's depleted? Okay, yeah, you could say more inflow than outflow, but yes, exactly. Nicholas uh, hit it, as did Teague, and, and, and uh, Rachel put it in another way. Um, it's the kind of susceptibles um, gets depleted. And as Rachel says, you could think of this as well in terms of, well, I want to refine Rachel's point, point is, uh, she, she's absolutely right in pointing to the effective reproductive number, this reproductive number that, or excuse me, the, the, a reproductive number. Um, R0 is actually specific to the basic reproductive number. And that that's a constant that you may or may not know, but um, from the standpoint of, of, of modeling, it's normally assumed it's a, it's a constant. It's how many people would an infective, in fact, in an otherwise totally susceptible population. That doesn't change over time. Yeah, it's, it's R sub R star, so that X would be a star, um, an asterisk, sometimes called a Nathan Hale for reasons I won't explain. Um, alternatively, uh, it's written R, R sub E or sometimes R sub T. Um, yeah, Utsman is right, except it's R under bar star, not R, yeah. It's our under bar star. Um, I'm using a under bar to, sorry, <laughs> under bar to indicate it's a subscript. Um, it goes below the R. Okay, now, um, 
uh, we we saw that fundamentally it's depletion of susceptibles this depletion of the fuel that keeps the fire going that means at some point the fire goes starts to go extinct it just drops the number of people who are still infected just drops and drops at some point it's no longer sustainable and what is that point yes we need latex support for zoom darn right um awesome um at what point is the infection no longer self-sustaining when what and what is the case at what point does the number of people who are still infected drop yeah, when RE, the effective reproductive number is less than one. Each infective can't infect even enough to replace themselves. So the numbers drop. Uh, you could also say the inflow becomes less than the outflow for infection. Um, so infection is less than recovery. And that, that would also be true. It's no longer sustaining. Uh, and it dies down. It's that key point of when the effective reproductive number tips below one, the infection starts to draw down. And typically that's not going to be less than, I mean, th there's going to be people remaining susceptible in the population. Particularly, it's common that it's going to be that point where R star is less than one would be the point where the fraction who are still susceptible is what? Does anyone remember that? The fraction who are susceptible at the point where R, R sub E, R, the, the effective reproductive number equals one, the fraction that are susceptible is what? Anyone? Now, if you look back uh, two lectures, you'll see the fraction that are remain susceptible is one over R zero, or actually it's one over R sub zero. Um, so, so in other words, it's one over that is the fraction that remains susceptible. If that fraction remains susceptible, if, if it's below that, um, the basic reproductive number uh, is going to be less than one. Uh, and that was something that we derived because the effective reproductive number, I'll call it R sub E, I'll also call it R sub T, I'll also call it R sub star, use any of those terms, is equal to uh, very, very widely, we see it equal to F times R0, uh, where um, I'm, I'm just introducing this term called F, which is S over N, the fraction that are susceptible, that remains susceptible. So the effect of reproductive numbers, the basic reproductive number times one over, or excuse me, times the fraction of people that are susceptible. So if my ba if my basic reproductive number is six, but only half of people are susceptible, what would the effective reproductive number be right now? If if I'm partway through the epidemic and half there's only half of the susceptible the population that remains susceptible. What will be the effective reproductive number? So again, I'm positing a basic reproductive number as in our model of six. What would the effective reproductive number be now if only half the population is susceptible? Yeah, no, no it's not two. I welcome suggestion. Yeah, it's three. Because F is 0.5 times the basic reproductive number, R0. And that's the formula right there, right? R sub E, the effective reproductive number equals the fraction susceptible. So that's half, 0.5, in other words, times the basic reproductive number, basic reproductive number R0.
Yeah, so there's this key throttling effect of the availability of susceptibles. If, if there's only a tenth, the original number, a tenth of the population is susceptible, then your effective reproductive number will be one tenth of the basic reproductive number. If, if the fraction of people who remain susceptible is 0.5, so it's 50% of the full population, then your effective reproductive, effective reproductive number will be half of your basic reproductive number. That was a bit of, that, that, that's exactly right. Thank you, Tusa. So that was a bit of um, reflection. And then we, we did something final to change the results dramatically in our final minutes of class. What did we do in our final minutes of class? What, how did we change the model structure? Remember this idea, structure determines behavior. How did we change the model structure? In the final minutes, yeah, we introduced waning of immunity. So we allowed people who had been recovered to wane in their immunity, exactly, to go back and become susceptible again, right? So you could say add a feedback from recovered to susceptible. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, it's an interesting sort of feedback. It's a, it's a feedback and material sort of feedback, um, uh, people can flow, and it really dramatically changes the behavior. It's like night and day before this and after this. So what was the difference in behavior between when we just had SIR by itself, no waning of immunity, versus when we introduced waning of immunity? What was the difference in behavior? Can anyone say? What was, what was a notable difference? Yes, uh, the structure is a combination of stocks and the ways that flows connect between them. That's true. So, so it's a good question. Structure is extremely important. So, so the concept of structure is a is a fairly profound one. And and uh, here, when we talk about structure, we commonly talk about it, uh, Marcus, including the configuration of stocks and their flows, how they're connected up. Yes, absolutely. Um, we also talk some about, um, at a more detailed level, about how those flows depend on the stock. So is there a positive feedback, for example, involving, you know, this flow infection as depending on effectives, uh, et cetera, and you, you circle around. Um, or is there a negative feedback, like in a first order delay, for example? We commonly consider that part of structure as well. Um, so it's a, the form of the dependencies. Um, and, uh, and so when we say structure determines behavior, certainly it refers to the arrangements of susceptibles, effectives, and recovers. Um, but it also refers some to the feedback center in place. So hopefully that's helpful. So. In response to my question, Sophia, about how it changed behavior, Sophia said, rather than accumulating and plateauing, um, uh, recovered population members eventually filtered back into the susceptible population, which made the recovered population number oscillate. That's true. Uh, infectives oscillates uh, before settling down to a steady state, which may not be zero. Yes, exactly. The outbreak becomes endemic. That's, all of those are exactly right. But let me ask you this question. So, so maybe we'll we'll just review, you know, what that looked like. Um, I'm gonna run this with the baseline with this waning of immunity, and here we go, boom. And here we see the dynamics, and we see it approaching as Sophia articulated, and as Rachel was alluding to, we go to a uh, an endemic state where the infection remains circulating in the population, and uh, albeit at fairly low levels uh, compared to the maximum level it had reached. But it's always circulating. It doesn't go extinct. With this 
population that includes waning of immunity. Mm. Um, there were some comments about recovered, and, and those are also true. Um, uh, those go to a comparatively high level. In fact, this goes to a low level. So this is good. Um, uh, I like this. What is this level? I, I argued it to, for its significance and uh, argued there's a, a simple relation in place that dictates this level. Uh, what is that relationship? Um, what is it that sets this, this level of infectives? This level of infectives at this level of infectives is a certain property, a certain um, uh, a certain property, a certain criteria that is maintained at this level of infection that keeps it. Yes. Yeah. So Het says inflow equals outflow. That's true. Let me ask uh, for elaboration of that. Inflow equals outflow for what stock? For what stock? for all is exactly right. All is exactly right, precisely. All stocks are in equilibria. No stocks, in, in, in endemic equilibrium, no stocks are changing. They're in equilibria. Now this is not perfectly yet in equilibrium, but it's approaching it. And if we ran it out many times, it'd be getting closer and closer to this equilibrium after kind of wiggling around, you know, and sort of, Re-equilibrating, going through some some adjustments and rebalancing, it, it comes in, and so inflow equals outflow at that point. That's exactly right for all stocks. And if inflow equals outflow for all stocks, what's the derivative of 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 each and every stock? The derivative will be some particular value, and what, pray tell, is that value? Zero is exactly right. The derivative of all of the stocks will be zero. And this will allow you to derive the value of these endemic equilibria. In other words, what is the value of infective at equilibrium or of recovered at equilibrium or susceptible at equilibrium? And we're going to come back to that point. That won't be our quarry today, but soon it will be. And it will be a and it'll be motivated by this idea that at equilibrium the system is in balance. Inflow equals outflow for each and every stock. And for each and every stock, the derivative of that stock will be put it one more time into the into the chat. Mm -hmm. Zero. Zero. It ain't changing. It's not going up. It's not going down. It's changing not at all. It's changing by zero. Right? Rise over run, zero. Um, how much does it go up per unit time? Zero. Mm. At equilibrium. Mm. Now, let's let's come back to my question though. What is the criteria? What is the property? that obtains, that, that holds at this point of equilibrium with respect to infectives. Inflow equals outflow, that's good. That's, ex that's equally important for the other criteria that I'm about to ask. So inflow equals outflow for all stocks, excellent, mm -hmm. superb. But what's the other criteria? How about in terms of reproductive number? Yes, R star equals one. Now, uh, Sophia had said uh, infectives equals one over R0, but that's not quite true. What is it that equals one over R0? What is it that equals one over the basic reproductive number? Is it the fraction of, of infectives or the fraction of, what's that key throttle? Yes, it's F. It's the fraction of, of what? Of susceptibles. It's because the fraction of susceptibles is one over R0 that those infectives who normally would infect R0 people in an otherwise susceptible population can only infect one person. 
because they can only find one over R0 of, of the population around them. Maybe they'd normally infect six people, but here the susceptibles are one sixth of the population. So they only meet, they only can infect one person. Only one peop one sixth of normal people around them are susceptible. Mm. Um, so, so in a closed system, at any time, can we say that sine sum of the derivative of all stocks equals zero? No, no. Great question. Wonderful question. Thank you, T. Appreciate that. But is the derivative of the stocks um, zero at let's say at at time at this time here? Is the derivative of susceptible zero? At that time, is the derivative of infective zero? Is the derivative of recovered zero at this time? Does that look like the derivative of zero here? No. Point out to me a place that the derivative of the infective is zero. Give me a place that the derivative of the infective is zero. Point point out to me where where in this graph is the derivative of infective equal to zero? There's one very prominent place that it's equal to zero. Where is that? At the peak. That's exactly right. But are the derivative of all other stocks equal zero there? At, at that point where this is the case, is the derivative of susceptible equal to zero? No, it's dropping like a rock. Is the derivative of recovered equal to zero at this point? No, it's rising like a skyrocket. Um, oh, the sum of all the derivatives. No, no, it's a good, good question. But, but I mean, in general, we're going to have a model where it's not going to exhibit conservation, um, and and we're not going to have a we're not going to have a, a nice linear sort of uh, progression like this. By the way, I'm I'm ignoring this cumulative infections and coming this the the derivatives of, of all the stocks are zero. I'm talking about these stocks here. Is this one um is uh, so at this point here at this here point the derivative of those of all the stocks are zero, right? That's not the case here, even though the derivative of infectives equals zero. Um and it's not the case that the sum of them always equals zero in general. In this particular model, you could say, well, you know, people, this is going down by the amount this is going up, and that's going up by the amount this is going down, or this. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, it'll be, you know, sum up to zero, but uh, with these these three stocks, but uh, it's not a particularly interesting it's it's not particularly emblematic because we might have deaths coming out or we might have people coming in here and some of the stocks won't some of the derivatives won't be zero in general but it's a good question thank you um okay so so we're rehearsing some of the thinking behind it and uh this is the endemic equilibrium now there's one other equilibrium that we saw um well okay so i, I want to ask so that was the behavior before we get to that other equilibrium this this is the behavior here this here is the behavior for a population where you have this waning of immunity how would that be different when we have no waning of immunity i'm going to do something that you should not do at home Okay, um, I'm going to put zero for this. Just I'm going to disable it. You might say I could make this super, super large and, and not that much is true, but I'm, I'm just going to make it 0, 0.0 times this. Don't do this at home. You can easily forget that it's changed there, but I'm just going to disable this. The effect of this is to turn off this flow. Why is it? Why is the effect of this to turn off this flow? Can anyone say? Because the rate of the flow will be what? Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I ran this, what would I see? 
and I, I think there was uh, an attempt to answer this. Uh, other equilibrium was when the infection was wiped out. Yes, yes, <laughs> Rachel, you're thinking ahead, and I like it. Okay, so if we were to run this, what would we see? Yes, it's a, a closed population. That's correct. It'll be a closed population with no waning immunity. And what will it look like? No recover becoming susceptible again. Okay, so, so what will it look like? Just remember what will be going on. Will the number of infectives rise initially? You tell me. Will the number of infectives rise initially? Yes. And then will it stay high? Or what will it do after it reaches that it reaches a high level? And then what will it do? It decrease and it will go basically to zero. Mark is exactly right. It exhausts the fuel for the fire. The fuel for the fire are the susceptibles. And they'll be exhausted. Um, and not totally. Not totally. There's some of them left over. Remember that 754, number 753 or whatever it was? But but it'll be, they'll be drained down to a, to a fraction of their value. And, and so the number of infectives, I mean, they don't have fuel for their fire. And so they're going to drop, you know, after, at this point where infective is in balance, where in fact, the inflow equals outflow for infective or where R star equals one, and they each infective infects exactly one person before recovering. At that point, what is the fraction that are susceptible? What's the fraction that are susceptible at this point? We said it earlier. What's the fraction that are susceptible when the infectives are, are yes. The fraction that are susceptible is one over or not. Sophia mentioned it earlier um, or, or was moving to mention it. That's right. And Tusif is, is correct. That's right. And then after that, it all goes downhill from there, so to speak. The susceptibles here are one over or not, and then they get depleted even more in this downslope, right? And on this downslope, there's more people who are recovering than are getting infected. That's why it's dropping, right? And it's still depleting susceptibles yet more. And so you've got this accelerant, right? Already... Already, you know, it, the infections can't keep up with the recoveries, and so it's dropping. And we're, deple we're depleting even further the number of susceptibles. So it's draining down. And because the number of infectives is draining down, we have fewer infection, new infections taking place because the number of new infectives is, or the number of infectives is, is dropping. And so we have fewer and fewer infections just because there's also fewer infectives around and there's fewer susceptibles. And so we're in this kind of death spiral of it and it goes down to near zero. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference from the endemic case. Mm -hmm. There are people left over um, who never got infected or who dodged the infection all through. Um, but most people by this point are recovered. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the basic uh, idea here. We rehearse some basic relationships that I hope you'll remember for a quiz near you. Okay, and for a final exam. Okay, so we're going to stop this. And I know you can download this model from the course site. And if you need to, proceed to do that now. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to stop uh, stop this recording.